Shabbat Shalom, everyone. Shabbat Shalom. Tell your neighbor Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat shalom. How about trying Boker Tov? Boker Tov. Which means good morning in Hebrew. So we get into the Word of God today. You ready to get in the Word of God? Yes. yes. Amen. This week's portion is called Parshat Ve'echanan from the Torah portion of Deuteronomy, which is called uh, Devarim in Hebrew. And we're looking at a message today called Torah Psalms. How many enjoyed the uh, message last week on the 15 Songs of Ascent and uh, also Psalms of David 120 through 134 that are all under the psalmist ministry of David, but we found out different psalms are written by David, Solomon, sons of Korah, and others. I thought I'd continue on with that concept of psalms, but because the psalms are 150 and they're put together in five books, it's just like the Torah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, five books of instruction. Therefore, let's look at those five books of the Psalms of David in the same way. So I've called this portion or message Torah Psalms. Can you try that today? Torah, Torah Psalms. Psalms. And it's really just an encouragement to stay in God's word. So this morning we say Shabbat Shalom and welcome to everyone. Let's welcome our first time guest. This Torah reading has come from Deuteronomy 3.23-7.11, through 7, 11, the book of Devarim. And the prophet reading that accompanies it is Yeshayahu, which is Isaiah 41 through 26, where we get the first words in that portion, Nachamu, Nachamu, Ami. And it is called today Shabbat Nachamu, which is the Shabbat of comfort. For God said in Isaiah 40, verse 1, comfort, comfort my people. And then we had Matthew 23, and the one I wanted to focus on today in, in rehearsing the Shema is Mark 12, 28 through 34. So I actually want to start with the concept of Shema, and we see that it's, it's seen in Deuteronomy 4.1, and it says, Now Israel, listen, or Shema, to the laws and the rulings I am teaching you, in order to follow them so that you will live. Then you will go and take possession of the land that Adonai, the God of your fathers, is giving you. This word Shema, can you say Shema? Shema. Shema comes from this root of Shin Mem Ein, and this root Shema actually means to hear. It says to hear intelligently, often with implication of intention or obedience, uh, and it goes on to say uh, causatively to tell. Uh, it means to be attentively called, to, uh, to gather, to, to be together, to carefully, to consent, to consider, even to declare or discern, to give an ear to something to cause or let or make to hear. It, it means to listen, to a noise, uh, to be obedient or obey, to perceive or make a proclaim, to publish, regard, report, show forth, make a sound, to tell, to understand, whosoever heareth, or to be a witness. These are the ways it's translated in the King James Bible. And this root, Shema, is what we see in the text of uh, Deuteronomy 4.1. And then we find out that this shows up again in understanding in chapter 6 of the Shema. But before we go past chapter 4, verse 1, let's go down to the fourth, 44th verse. And let's see this very important passage. It says, this is the Torah that Moshe placed before the people of Israel. These are the instructions or the edot or testimonies, the laws, hukim, which are decrees, and the rulings, Mishpatim, which Moshe presented to the people of Israel after they came out of the land of Egypt. Where did Israel come out from? Egypt. Egypt. Now we looked at Abraham, who had to go to Egypt and then ended up in the promised land. We looked at 17 steps two weeks ago that he took 17 steps, but 14 of them were in the land of Israel. When he was told to leave his father's pagan household of idol worship and go to a land that I will show you, he was going, the Hebrew says, to a city whose maker and building is God. How many know that the builder and maker of the city of Jerusalem is God? Amen. The God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Hebrews, the God of creation, the God of heaven and earth is the God that made the city of Jerusalem, the place where his name would be forever, his ears and his eyes would be there forever, his heart would be there forever, and most important, his Shekinah glory or presence would be there forever. 
And when you travel to the land of Israel, like many of you are contemplating of doing, um, maybe this November, be able to go to Israel. And this is the thing that if you consider going to Israel, when you get off the plane, you will feel the presence of God. When you go to the Kotel, the Wailing Wall, as it's sometimes called, or the Retaining Wall of the Temple, you will feel the presence of God. Sometimes people touch and kiss the ground the moment they get off the plane because they feel the presence of God, the kiss of God on that land. Therefore, the Hebraic way to show affection is to kiss towards something. In fact, worship is one big kiss towards God. Hands lifted up or an embrace, and then when we worship him and speak words of kindness, words of love, words of praise, it's sweet nothings in his ears. It's the kiss of God in worship. The Greeks translated the word worship, proskuneo, which means to kiss toward. So therefore, to kiss is a sign of affection. How many know when we worship our God, it's a sign of affection? That we love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our strength. Everything we do. And husbands, you say yes and a amen. amen. Because when your wife married you, she didn't want part of you. She wanted all of you. You can't just say I love you with your heart and not love her with your resources. Amen. And all the men say, oh me. <laughs> you got to love God with every part of you because God wants all of you. How many know you don't marry part of a person? You marry all of them. When you came in a relationship with God, you came into a relationship with his son. You came in a relationship through his Holy Spirit. And when you understand the relationship of the love of the father and the, the willingness of the son to fulfill his father's love and the willingness of the Holy Spirit to fulfill that love, that shed abroad love in your hearts through the Holy Spirit's power, that it would go forth like a river of living water, a river of life, a river of love, a river of the life of God. When you understand that, it's easy to love God with all your heart with all your soul, with all your strength. Because every good and perfect gift comes from who? The Father of lights, the light of God, the love of God, the life of God. It's the manifestation, the essence, and the expression of who God is. When we understand that, it's easy to be like our Father, to be perfect as He is, perfect in heart. How are you perfect in heart like God? In our flesh we can't be perfect, but in our hearts we can love God with everything we have. All of our being wants to love. Amen. Amen. How many have that kind of love for God? You love him with all your heart. Amen. How about the person sitting next to you? Do you love them? Because yes. if you can't love your brother, your sister, who you can't see, how many know you can't love God who you can't see? Right. All right. So if we take a look at this portion, I have three fill-ins for you today, and I want you to fill it in from, these, um, from the spaces that you see in verse number 45. It says, these are the instructions... Or really, it's the word translated in most translations, testimonies, and it is edot. Fill that word in, edot. E-I-D-O-T, fill that in in the first line. You can even put that it means a testimony. It is actually the same word that we get the enlarged ein and the enlarged dalit of shma and echad. Ed, to be a witness, to be a testifier. That there is one God. He is the only one. And when you understand ed, or to be a witness, and adult witnesses or testimonies, everything that God has commanded us to keep as like the Sabbath day or the feast days, they are testimonies of the power of God. Have you thought about Shabbat? What is Shabbat a testimony of? God is our creator. How about keeping Passover? He's our redeemer, our savior, our deliverer. How about, how about keeping Pentecost or Shavuot, the Feast of Weeks? What is he? The giver of the, the Torah. And when he gave us the Torah, it's like David saying to Solomon, Shema, or listen, or obey the words of your father, the instructions of your father. The book of Proverbs is written as a letter from a father to a son. How many of the Torah is written as a letter from the father to sons? daughters. Do you understand that everything God will ever do when he commands you to keep certain days are not about legalism of days. The scripture even tells us in Colossians, don't let anybody judge you concerning the Sabbath or holy days. Do you know what we have done with that? We've said, see, you don't have to keep the Sabbath anymore. Wait a minute, but I get to. I don't have to. I get to keep it. Because if I will not defame or profile, uh, 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 defile or profane the Sabbath, as Isaiah 56 tells us, I get to keep the Sabbath, and no person in Israel can tell me that I can't. Right. It happens to be that I have Jewish blood, so therefore I get to keep it because I'm commanded to keep it. 
For those that do not have Jewish blood, guess what? You have no direct command, but you get an invitation to come into the covenant of Israel and be one through the Messiah and actually observe the Sabbath as a rest and a gift to mankind, not a legalistic requirement. Amen. You get to be here today. It's a joy to do it. There's no, no one forcing you. Do you see any chains on your neighbor's hands? <laughs> well, that, that old law, we've got to get rid of that old law because of all those commandments like the Sabbath. Don't let anybody judge you concerning the Sabbath. Well, then stop judging me. <laughs> if I get to keep it, don't judge me for keeping it. Amen. And I won't judge you for keeping Sunday as a day of worship. Because guess what? I worship on Sunday too. And Monday, and Tuesday, and Wednesday, and Thursday, and Friday. But Friday at sundown, there's one day of the week from Friday night at sundown to Saturday at sundown. It is from evening to morning, the Sabbath. Six days he created the world. Seventh he rested. Sabbath is a, is a, a testimony that he's creator. Shavuot, that he's giver of the Torah. Right? How about Sukkot? He tabernacled with Israel in the wilderness, and the clouds of glory was with them. And he is the one that brings the full harvest. So therefore, he is the one that provides. And when you eat and you are satisfied, you will bless the Lord. Uh, Deuteronomy chapter 8 tells us, we will bless the Lord because he is our provider. Ah, that's beautiful. Not only did he provide the promised land, he provided the milk and honey of the land, the seven species of the land, the wheat, the barley. He provided all the pomegranates and the figs. He provided the grapes and the olives. And the dates for the honey, not bee honey, a date honey, just like those date shakes we have in the desert. So anyway, we understand, don't, don't mean to get you hungry this morning, but anyway, we understand that God is a provider. God is a giver. God is a redeemer. God is a healer. God is a restorer. And all of these witnesses or testimonies are just like the Israeli or Jewish family that puts a mezuzah on their door with the words of the Shema to remind them to, that they were commanded to put on the doorpost, just like the blood of the lamb that was applied on the doorpost. And by the blood of the lamb, Israel was saved. Guess what? How are Jewish people saved today? The same way. By the precious blood of the lamb. Everything that was in the Torah is a blueprint for you and I today. Israel's story is history, but it's also his story. He became the Passover lamb. Amen? He is the giver of the Torah, the teacher of Torah. He is the one that brings in the harvest, the wheat and the tare, the sheep and the goat. He brings in the harvest. He separates after harvest time the, the wheat and the tare. Therefore, he allows it all to grow together because he knows he's the one that throws in the sickle to reap the harvest. Do you understand that everything that Israel was commanded is a picture for you and I today? Man, I just want to kind of blow your mind, but I don't want you to lose your mind. I want you to keep your mind and renew your mind according to the will of God today. How many already got enough, uh, uh, enough just from that and just want an altar call? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> because you say, wait a minute, I'm not there yet, but I might slow down. Well, sometimes the goodness of God is so rich that it takes weeks and weeks and weeks in the synagogue to go over things that we've studied for years until we grasp the revelation of Amen. Amen. We've been reading these verses for years. How many have been reading the New Testament for years? If you're Jewish, maybe not. Maybe you've been reading the Older Testament for years and not the Newer Testament. But if you're, you're a believer here today in Yeshua, you've probably been reading the New Testament for years. Let me see your hands. How many have understood it as a Jewish book all your life? How many have understood it from Jewish concepts and precepts? You haven't. Therefore, we have to renew our mind today. Because before there ever was a New Testament, there was the Torah. And before there ever was a New Testament, there were the prophets. And before there ever was a New Testament, there were the royal writings, starting with the book of Psalms. And we understand everything Yeshua said, I came to not destroy, but to fulfill. But guess what? As students, we fulfill the rabbi's teachings. We do what he did. So we should be fulfilling the greatest commandment. In fact, how do you fulfill Torah? Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because if you love your neighbor as yourself, you won't kill them. You won't murder him. You won't steal from him. You won't covet his things or his wife. You won't dishonor your parents. All these things you will do easily when you put first things first. Love is the motivation to keep in commands, not legalism. Aren't you glad that it's love that motivates and not legalism? 
Why do you think he gave you the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKodesh? Why do you think he gave you the Spirit of God, the, Ru the Ruach Elohim? Because Elohim wanted you to know from creation, man was created by the breath of God, inspire him, him to come alive and to do what he did, the activity of his limbs, the voice that he would speak with, the very uh, uh, knowledge in his mind that he would be able to name all of creation. That was by the Ruach Elohim. The Spirit of God. What makes us think today we can keep any of the commandments of God without the Ruach Elohim? Yeshua didn't come to destroy. He came to fulfill. So he said, therefore, you must receive the Ruach HaKodesh. You must receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed upon them. And they believed. And they received. And they were empowered today. And so as we take a look at the portion uh, of Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 1 it says now this is the mitzvah please silence all cell phones now this is the mitzvah the laws and the rulings which Adonai your God ordered me to teach you notice this the mitzvah or the command Israel would call that a good deed uh, now this is the mitzvah or the command and the laws and the rulings which Adonai commanded you now watch this we saw that the first category was adult what is the second category I want you to look at that is hukim. Write that in. If you haven't filled that in, it's number two. Hukim are divine decrees that don't always make sense. The ashes of the heifer to cleanse those who have touched the dead. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But we've learned in, 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 in previous portions how the ashes of the red heifer and the water and the, and the dove and the scarlet cord, all of it speak of cleansing process of either a leper or the cleansing process of someone who's touched the dead or someone who needs to be cleansed from some outward uncleanness. Therefore, it's a picture in Hebrews 9.14 yes. that the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the red heifer cannot clean anything but the outside. Therefore, it's a picture of what cleanses the inside. That Yeshua the Messiah, through the Spirit of God, offered himself without spot to God, was able to cleanse our hearts and that dead conscience so we could serve a living God. When you understand that, we don't put law against grace because it's law and grace. In fact, without law, you don't need grace. Have you ever asked a judge for grace? He would think you were crazy. We shouldn't have. If you had not broken a crime and broken the law and here you are asking for grace, who needs grace when you have obedience? You only need grace as empowerment when you're coming up short because of sin. And so the Holy Spirit has come to pour out that grace, that mercy, that faith, that love, so it makes it easy to keep the commands of God. We've made it complicated. We've told people they can't do it, but then we tell them they're sinners for not doing it. <laughs> you ever thought about that? How could you ever call anybody in this room a sinner and bring them to a saving knowledge of Yeshua if there's no breaking of the Torah? And how cruel of a God would he be if he condemned us to a place of judgment and told us to keep things that we could never keep in the first place? How cruel would our God be? No, it's not that we couldn't keep him. It's that we didn't lean upon him to keep him. Because without the Ruach HaKodesh, without the Holy Spirit, you can't keep him anyway. You need the same spirit that inspired the Torah to be the one to inspire you to do the Torah. <laughs> you see how we mix things up? We just threw out three of our Bible right. and settled for a quarter the New Testament. Right. Did you know that the Hebrew Scriptures, the Older Testament, is actually more than the Newer? Therefore, if you get rid of the quote-unquote Old Testament, you've ripped out three quarters of your Bible. And you're living on an added portion one quarter. How many know that's a deficient diet? <laughs> we need the full counsel of the Word of God. Amen? <laughs> now, the third category was mishpatim. Make sure you write that in. Mishpatim are the rulings of a judge. Therefore, sometimes they're called rulings. And these rulings are the rational rulings of a judge. They make sense. So if you commit the crime, how many know that the punishment should fit the crime? Amen? So those are the three categories. The testimonies, which are witnesses, something God has done in the past, or who he is in our life. The hukim, which are sometimes divine decrees that we do it because he said it, but not because it always makes sense. And then there's the rational rulings, mishpatim, which makes sense, because when the judge gives a ruling, it should make sense according to the crime. Amen? Amen. So now, let's go on and look at 
verse number three. He says, therefore, listen, or Shema Israel, take care to obey so that things will go well with you, so that you will increase greatly as Adonai, the God of your ancestors, has promised you, uh, promised you by giving you a land flowing with what? Milk and honey. Look at verse four. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, Adonai our God, uh, um, Adonai is one. If you go down to verse 17, I love this. It says, in verse 17, it says, Observe diligently the mitzvot or commandment of Adonai your God and his instructions and laws which he gave, uh, has given you. You are to do what is right and good in the sight of Adonai, so that the things so that things will go well with you and you will enter and possess the good land Adonai swore to your ancestors. Now, there is something that I want to discuss in relationship to the Psalms of David enlightened unto the Torah. But first I want to review some keys of interpretation. The first thing we said about interpreting scripture is the number one thing we have to do. We learned this two weeks ago. We rehearsed it last week. I want to make sure you remember it. First key of interpretation is always lay the foundation of truth with what? The Torah of truth. What was given first? The Torah. So for hundreds of years, man only had the Torah. Therefore, it's the first principles of the oracles of God. The first principles. Therefore, first comes first. You've got to apply the principles that come first before you can learn those that come second. The second thing we realize we must do as we lay that foundation is use the law of first mention. Wherever we chronologically know something has come first, we use the law of first mention to define first Hebrew terms and meanings. Because the Bible is not inspired in English. It's not inspired in Spanish or French or Italian. It's not even really inspired, as far as the Hebrew scriptures go, in Greek. They're inspired in Hebrew first. It's the first language of the Bible. Second is Aramaic, third is Greek. Therefore, the inspiration comes from the original words of God. And every Aramaic word and Greek word have to be compared to the original Hebrew term and thought to get the true, deep meaning out of it. The third thing we know we must do is what? Just let Hashem, let Hashem teach us line upon line. We know precept upon precept from His instructions, His Torah. So whatever God gave first, we start with that. Whatever thing God gave second, we move on to that. Whatever God gave third, we continue to study that. Whatever he gave forth, we continue to study that. So it should be the law, the prophets, the writings, and then the new covenant. In fact, when you read the Gospel of John, you should be reading Genesis. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God, nothing was created without him. That's because in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Right? What do you think John was referencing? Every Jewish ear heard Bereshit, bara Elohim, et ha-shamayim, et ha In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. So the revelation was, how did he create the heavens and the earth? With his word. But his word was in the beginning with God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. <laughs> no one's uh, seen God at any time. That was Moses' revelation, right? right? Show me your glory. No, you can't see my face and live. But the only begotten of the Father, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, he has revealed him to us. And in the face of Yeshua the Messiah, we see the Father. Amen? So what I'd like to do is... I want to go back. I want to look at something here. Psalms uh, is very important to the understanding of Scripture. And I found a couple commentaries on that. One of them says this. It says, Psalms 41, 72, and 89 end with a double amen. While 106 and 150 end with praise the Lord. Are there reasons for breaking it up like this beyond the double amen? I'm a bit perplexed because of this answer, which reads the line about the prayers of David being ended as part of the psalm rather than a marker in the greater book. And this despite it coming after the devil, amen. This is a commentary I just kind of pulled out of the text uh, from a, a topic on David and the psalms and how they were compiled together like the Torah. And the reason I pulled this one first is because I found this interesting about the double amens. Look at, for your, look at it for yourself. Look at Psalms 141, 72, and 89. They actually end the books of the book of Psalms. Because the one book is divided into five. So they end almost to separate them with a double amen, except for those that end with praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay? So if we take a look at 
the importance of scripture and Torah, um, it takes us to Bereshit, the first mention of the word Torah in scripture. Very first time. How many know every time we've done a, a law first mention, it always goes back to Abraham? Every time we use the law first mention, it seems lately it's always gone back to Abraham. As it says in Genesis 26, 5. All this is because Abraham, or Abraham, heeded what I said and did what I told him to do. He followed my mitzvot, which are commandments, my regulations, the mishpatim, and my teachings, which is the Torah. Torah. The second time we find it, if we use the concept of two or three witnesses for every word to be established, is the one law or one Torah for even the Gentile as well as the native-born Jew. So the native-born and the stranger or foreigner or Gentile, if they dwell together in the land of Israel, they have one Torah. There's not two Torahs, there's one Torah. Amen. I'm not referring to oral Torah and written Torah. I'm talking about God's word. There's not two things God said. There's only one thing God said. And the, the Torah is one law for Jew and Gentile. Amen. Now, that is not trying to put legalism on a Gentile. That is saying there's one set of instructions for the whole world. One set of instructions for the whole world. And when we understand that, we look at the third time it's mentioned. The third, third time Torah is ever mentioned. Once with Abraham in Genesis 26, 5. Another time in Exodus 12, 49. And now third in Exodus 13, 9. And look what it says. It shall be a sign to you on your hand and a memorial between your eyes. Referring to tefillin. Those little phylacteries that are put on the head and on the arm. Israel has the words of the Shema. That the words, excuse me, that the Lord's law or Torah may be in your mouth, for with a strong hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt. So here's Abraham keeping Torah. Here's Jew and Gentile keeping Torah. And here's even a testimony of keeping Torah that the same God who says, put it on your hand and put it between your eyes, is saying, keep it in your mouth. Keep it in your mouth. Keep the Torah where? In your mouth. The reason we put it on our hand, and the reason we put it on our head, and the reason we put it on our doorpost is because we want to keep it in our mouth. Right. We want constant reminders or testimonies, adult, to keep the word God in our mouth. If you're not speaking the word every, every day, the enemy's speaking to you a different word. Wow. I'll say it again. If you're not speaking the word of God every day, then you have another voice, the enemy, speaking a different word to your ears and to your heart. How many have heard the enemy try to tell you words of fear, words of doubt, words of insecurity lately? Let me see your hands. Be honest. It's okay. We all have heard those other words. But how many know every word of the enemy needs to be combated by the word of God? Because we're in a spiritual warfare. It's a battle going on. You think Israel had battles? We have a battle. And the way they won their battles with the help of God is the way we will win our battles. Bizrat Hashem. With the help of God. We understand that. We understand that, that all of these psalms are for us. In fact, commentary goes on to say there are a Davidic group of psalms, like 3 through 41. There are sons of Korah, 42 through 49. There's another Davidic group, 51 through 65. There's Asaph, who had a group of psalms in 73 through 83, which were mostly temple worship. We have the sons of Korah. Remember Korah got swallowed up? His sons got a chance to redeem themselves and to speak praise instead of complaining against Moses and Aaron, as Korah did. And it's Psalms 84 through 89. And then we have congregational praise, 95 through 100. Then we have the hallelujah group. How many like that hallelujah group? <laughs> or some of these are called the hallel. The hallelujah group, where we get the word hallel, hallelujah, is 111 through 117. And then the Psalms of Ascent that we studied last week. Psalms 120 through 134, we found out 15 songs of ascent are like the 15 steps to ascend into the temple in Yeshua's day. Amen? Amen. So grateful for those 15 steps or those 15 songs of ascent. How about the number nine? The third Davidic group is Psalms 138 through 145. And lastly, Congregation of Praise, I think that's supposed to say 146 through 150. I think I lost some numbers there. 146 through 150. So that's a quick overview. But really, the breakdown that is most important to today's study is the Psalms in most Bibles are divided into what? Five 
five sections or books. Go ahead and take a look at Psalms 1. Go ahead. Turn there. Psalms 1. Yeah. Go ahead. Look at it. Take a look in your Bibles. Let me see you go to your Bibles. Take a look. What do you see there when you're looking at Psalms 1? Book 1. Book 1. How many have actually noticed that before? Miss your hand. How many have never really noticed it before? How many would admit that even though you know it had book one, you didn't know the significance of why it says book one? Thank you. Let me see your hands again. Real nice and high. You didn't know the significance of it. Right, good. How many have had questions about it? Let me see. Should be everybody's hand now. <laughs> You've all had questions at one time or another. It goes on to say the Psalms were arranged into five subdivisions or books. This order follows the fivefold division of the Pentateuch, which we know is the Torah, and may reflect the process of collecting these songs and prayers into Israel's hymn book. And this is a Christian commentary, by the way. It wasn't even Jewish. It was a Christian. So the Christian world seeing that there must be something deeper to the songs than just the fact that David loved them so much. David loved them like he loved the Torah. Oh, how I love thy law. <laughs> I love thy Torah. It is arranged in the five-fold scheme. In the fact, the ancient Jewish scholars saw a comparison between the five books of Moses' law and the five divisions of the book of Psalms. The early commentary on Psalms 1-1 called by the Hebrews the Midrash. Did you catch that? The Midrash, they call it. Uh, it says, Moses gave to the Israelites the five books of the law corresponding with these uh, David gave Excuse me, David gave them the five books of the Psalms. I'm going to read that again. Moses gave to the Israelites the five books of the law, and corresponding with these, David gave them the five books of the Psalms. So even the rabbinic sages reveal this truth. A good discussion on the re resemblance of each of the five divisions is given in most commentaries at the start of the book of Psalms. Take a look at yours. Yours might understand that. The Psalms are like the Torah. Psalms 1 through 41 is book 1. Psalms that ends with amen, amen. Like the five scribal lines or four spaces between each book of the Torah. So it says amen, amen at the end of Psalms 41, leading to 42 through 72 is book 2, which we could say is like Exodus because book 1 is like Genesis. Then Psalm 73 through 89, book 3, Leviticus. And Psalms 90 through 106, which we know is book 4, Book of Numbers, and Psalms 107 through 1, oh, it should say 150 there, I'm not sure. I think it's some, in some translations they must have 51, but it should be 150, book 5. And that's like the book of Deuteronomy. How interesting that Yeshua himself said this. He said, this is what I meant when I was still with you. And I told you that everything written about me in the Torah of Moshe, the prophets, and the Psalms had to be fulfilled. You see, that's the breakdown of the three areas of the Hebrew Scriptures as given to us before there was ever a New Testament written. The Torah, which is the Law of Moses. The Prophets, from Joshua all the way to Malachi. Not our Christian order, but the Jewish order. And then the writings, starting with the largest book written there, Psalms 100, uh, Psalms, uh, uh, with 150 Psalms in it, all the way to Second Chronicles. So all those poetic, historical books that we record, they're all there, but they're called the royal writings, found mostly in royal courts. Okay? Now, if we go further, we see that Psalm number one is just like book one. In fact, it speaks of two trees, just like the Garden of Eden had two trees. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly. Think of Adam walking with God in the cool of the day. Nor stands in the path of sinners. Think of that serpent about the side of the way that was trying to tempt Adam and Eve. He says, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but in his delight is the law, the Torah of the Lord. And in his law, or Torah, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a what? Tree. tree planted by the rivers of water. Remember the trees of life planted on either side of the river? How many remember that message? He goes on to say, his, uh, it will bring forth its fruit in season, whose leaf shall not wither. Whatever it does shall what? Prosper. But the ungodly are not so because they're like the chaff which the wind drives away. You know what I think about when I read this psalm? I think of tumbleweeds. Yeah. Trees that were once rooted but blow with the wind. 
because they dried up from the root. You know, false prophets and false teachers are like trees that have been plucked up from the roots. Remember the tree that didn't produce fruit, the fig tree? Or it didn't have the sign of that first fig? So that little small fig, my rabbi showed me his fig tree uh, in Desert Hot Springs when it first grew. There was one little tiny fig, no other fruit on it. And Yeshua was looking for the first fruits because if the first fruits are holy, the rest is holy. It's a sign of a good harvest. It wasn't the season for figs, but he was looking for the first fruits. He's still looking for first fruits. He's looking for your first fruits. Because if the first fruits are holy, the rest are holy. Now, it's amazing that when you look at this, that there's two types of trees there just like the Garden of Eden. That sets the whole concept of walking with God in the cool of the day like Adam before he sinned. And the themes of book one, or these first 41 psalms, all speak of creation just like it relates it to the end when all things of creation lost or regained. Paradise lost, it's paradise regained. Themes like the Messiah in Psalms 2, being king on his holy hill, Zion. Because when Messiah comes back, the Garden of Eden will be restored to mankind. And we will see for a thousand years, berries will be body, uh, bodies will be buried, but trees of life will spring up and the leaves will be healing for the nations. What leaves? The leaves of the tree of life on either side of the river. In fact, some of these psalms are psalms like Psalms 119. Or actually, I brought this up just to show you the delight of David. Because Psalms 1 actually speak of the Torah. And Psalms 119 speak of the Torah. Actually, just like Psalms 19. The law of the Lord is perfect. Psalms 119 says, I delight myself in your statutes. He goes on to say that I delight myself and your commandments. He goes on to say in verse 77, for your law is my delight. He says, the law had been my delight. He goes on to say in Psalms uh, 119, 143, trouble and anguish have overtaken me, yet your commandments are my delights. And verse 174, I long for your salvation, O Lord, your law is my delight. You know what Paul said in Romans? He says, I delight after the law of God after the inward man. Your spirit man delights in the law of God. And why have we been trying to get rid of it for almost 2,000 years now? Replacement theology. Right? Some of the psalms in this first book are messianic in theme. Psalms 2 speak of his anointed Messiah, recorded in Acts 4, 23 through 30, and speak of him being set as king upon the holy hill Zion, and he says that you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance. He also tells us to kiss the son, which we could translate as worship the son. Proskuneo, to kiss towards. So this second psalm is dealing with the restoration of creation lost, which will come through the Messiah. Other psalms in this passage also deal with creation. The chief musician, uh, 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 instrument of Gath, it says the psalm, of David, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the what? Heavens. Out of the babes and nursing infants, you ordain strength. Because of your enemies, you will make silence the enemy and the avenger. Watch this. Consider. When I consider your heavens and the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man, Enosh, that you are mindful of him? Or the son of man, Ben Adam, the sons of Adam, that you visit him? Wait a minute. He goes and rehearses creation. And it's recorded in Hebrews 2, 5 through 9. You have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, and you put all things underneath his feet. All sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea, that pass through the paths of the sea. O Lord, O Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth. So even though David is ruling as king, he's told that he will have a son, Messiah, that will rule as king, and the kingship will restore the creation that was lost because of sin. Every time Israel sinned, they lost the kingdom. Every time they're obedient, the kingdom's restored. Guess what? Creation lost will be creation regained. Paradise lost, paradise regained. How many see that theme throughout the scriptures? Because if you don't know God as creator, you can't know him as yud heh the covenant relational God, who is your peace, who is your righteousness, who is your healer. You can't know him, because in the beginning, God created the heavens and earth, Elohim. Do you know what happens to an atheist? They can't come into a relationship with a covenant God, because they don't believe in a God. Until you believe in God, you can't have a relationship with that God. So God didn't reveal himself through his covenant name. 
He revealed himself through his creator man. Because one day creator Elohim will be judge Elohim. <laughs> These are the themes throughout the Psalms. Look at Psalm 16. He even speaks of the resurrection of, of Messiah in verse 10. For you have, will not leave your, his soul in Sheol, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You show, show him the path of life, and in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Look at Psalms 22. The reason you have to have a resurrection of Yeshua is because Psalms 22 are the very words that Yeshua spoke from that sacrificial stake or the cross. He spoke these words, my God, my God, Eli, Eli, why have you forsaken me? Why are you far from helping me? Look at verse 6. I'm a worm, no man, a reproach of men, despised of people. All those who see me ridicule me. Remember when they spoke evil against him? Ridicule him? And all of these because these psalms are not only just the Torah, but Torah reveals Yeshua. Guess what the psalms also do? They reveal Yeshua. So these are messianic psalms that reveal Yeshua. It goes on to say in verse 17, I can count all my bones. They divide my garments. How many know none of Yeshua's bones were broken? And they actually gambled for his garments. So everything in Psalms 22 speak of Yeshua in his fulfillment. So not only was Moshe prophesying as a prophet, but David was prophesying as a prophet and a psalmist, not only to worship God. Why do you think the Bible tells us to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs and make melody in our heart for the Lord? Because the synagogue life of the first century always used the psalms as not only psalms of worship and praise, but as prophetic vision of the coming of Messiah. Do you understand we need to get our head in the Torah? Get our face out of Facebook and our face in the book? And we need to get also in the book of Psalms and read the Psalms every day. Take 30 days, you can read about five a day. We understand that you need to read the Psalms as not only songs, but as prophecy. Psalms 34. I love this one. Into your hand I commit my spirit. What did Yeshua say? Right before it is, when he said, it is finished, he says, into the, my hands, Father, I commit my spirit. You think David was just a psalmist? He was a prophet. He was prophesying through the psalms. And look at Psalms 40. I love this. Again, another psalm quoted in Hebrews 10, 5 to 10. Sacrifice and offering, you did, you did not desire. My ears, you have opened. Burnt offering and sin offering, you did not require. He says, then behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It's written of me. What did Yeshua say? Everything in the book is written of me. He goes on to say, it's written of me. He says, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. And your law is in, within my heart. Your Torah is in my heart. I proclaim the good news of righteousness in the great assembly. Indeed, I do not restrain my lips, O oh Lord, you yourself know. Wait a minute. What assembly is this? Yeshua would go to the synagogue. Yeshua would read from the Torah. Yeshua many times read from the prophets. Yeshua would give the drosh. He'd give the explanation of the readings. One day he read Isaiah 61. He said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. How could he do that if he didn't meditate in the Torah day and night? Like Psalm says to meditate in the Torah day and night. The Psalm says in Psalms 19 that the law of the Torah of the Lord is perfect. And Psalms 119 tells us that, oh, how I love your Torah. You see, the Torah is for meditation. Right. To think about not only praises of Israel to be praises of God, but the prophecies of Israel to be fulfilled in Yeshua. Amen. How many are receiving something today? Amen. Wow, this is good stuff. Wait a minute. Now, we've got to move on for time's sake to book number two. Book number two starts with Psalms 42, which says, as the deer panted for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. Don't make me go the rest of it, don't. Okay, now, wait a minute. This is a thirsty soul desiring water. Tell me, when in Israel's history, did Israel long for water in a dry and a thirsty land? 
40 years in the wilderness, starting with the book of Exodus. So the theme of book two, Psalms 42 starts with Israel thirsting for water for when they went through the Sea of Reeds. Well, you know it's the Red Sea sometimes. Uh -huh. They said, wait a minute, you brought us out here to kill us. We're thirsty. David says, no, I'm not thirsting for that water. I'm thirsting for living water. I'm thirsting for worship. I'm thirsting for worshiping God in spirit and in truth. For my well is like a well of water, spring of everlasting life. The words of Yeshua to a woman at a well. Don't you understand that when they were thirsty for water, David would say, no, they were really thirsty for God. Amen. They were thirsty for God. In fact, watch this. My soul thirsts for God and for the living God. When I shall come and appear before him, my tears have been for, for my food day and night. What did Israel ask for day and night? Food. What did they get in the day? Man. What came as a storm at night? Quail storm. And they said, stop it, God. First we're hungry, now we're not. Sound like us? Oh, I want this. No, I don't want this. No, give me this. No, take it away. God's not confused. We are. <laughs> we're the ones who should have We pray for a mate, and then when we get him, then we're saying, Lord, I need a divorce. <laughs> Why do you think God hates divorce? He says, what God puts together, let no man put us in. You understand that the theme of Exodus Give us this rich meaning of Israel's wandering in the wilderness, but it's because of the exodus from the bondage of Egypt. And also, the wonderful psalms that speak of Messiah, like this messianic psalm, Psalm 45, which is so amazing that it comes from the sons of Korah, getting a second chance. And I love what verse 6 says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever a scepter of righteousness, the scepter of your kingdom. You love righteousness and you hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you, speaking of the Messiah, with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Guess where this is quoted? Hebrews 1, 8 through 9. How about Psalm 69? It says here in verse 13, this is a Jewish prayer. As for me, my prayer is to you, O Lord, in the acceptable time. It goes on to say in verse number 21, they also gave me gall for my food and for my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. This is the fulfillment of Yeshua, John 19, 28 through 30. When he asked for something to drink, they gave him this gall or vinegar with the hyssop, the very hyssop that's used to sprinkle the unclean corn. <laughs> we need to move on. Psalm 73 gives us book three. Look how it starts. Truly God is good to Israel. Is he good to Israel? Yes. Wait a minute, this is book three, this is Leviticus. God is good to Israel, to such as a pure, a pure in heart. How many know none can walk up there but the pure in heart? So you couldn't go to the Mount of the Lord to sacrifice without the pure in heart. Which is why around the temple was 150 mikvot, immersion pools, to wash clean. Clean hands, clean heart. The picture is Leviticus, Levitical worship, atonement, sacrifice, redemption, worshiping, priestly worship, priestly honor, avodah, divine service. This is the theme of this third book. It should be the theme of these psalms. <laughs> Look at this. He says, but as for me, my feet, are also, uh, uh, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped. In other words, as I'm going to the mountain of the Lord to sacrifice, my feet almost slipped, but God has given us what? Those hinds feet. He says, for I was envious and boastful, and when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Now, verse 15 then says, the same passage, if I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Verse 17, until I went into the sanctuary or the temple of God. Then I understood their end. You see, the enemy's against me when I'm not in the temple. But when I come to the house of God, I realize what God's going to do to his enemy. He is going to defeat his enemy. Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. When the Torah goes forth, we say, Arise, O Lord, and let your enemies be scattered. Because when you come to the temple, that's when you know your God is with you. Amen. He's not just with you individually, he's with us. We don't go to the temple alone. We go in packs. <laughs> we go like piranhas. We go hungry. We go thirsty. We go thirsty for a living God. 
This is good stuff. Watch this. And it goes on to say in verse 28, but it is good for me to draw near to God. Actually, the Hebrew is kirvat Elohim. Remember when we studied about kirvat Hashem? The nearness of God. The closeness of God. This is from the root to draw close to God. Kirvat Elohim. He says, it's good for me to have kirvat Elohim. It's good for me to draw close. Guess what the root for offering is? Korban. 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 The root is karav. So the root here, kirvat Hashem, the nearness of God is the same root for drawing close to God with an offering. What is an offering? A draw close thing. Something by which we can draw close to God. It's kind of like when we say, put your, put your money where your mouth is. <laughs> my wife says it to me all the time, if you love me. <laughs> let me get, get my eyebrows plucked or you, let me uh, get my nails done, right? Because if you don't put your money where your mouth is, men, you can say you love them all day long, but you don't provide. You don't love your family if you don't provide. And offerings were a way, not with money, but with animal and grain and fruit. To come to God and say, God, I love you. This feeds my family, but I'm giving it to you, to the priesthood. I'm going to come in worship to God. In the nearness of God, it's good for me, he says. Oh, I didn't see my Hebrew root there, sorry. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. And I love the fourth book. The fourth book starts with Psalms 90. This one's really cool. Say really cool. Really cool. If you read the header, this is the song or prayer of Moses. So this would be related to the fourth book. What's the fourth book of the Torah? Numbers. Numbers. Where is the majority of the wilderness experience found in the Torah? Numbers. The book of Numbers. Look what it says. Lord, you've been our dwelling place, our habitation, our Shekinah glory, our sanctuary in all generations. So while God was tabernacling with men in all the generations of the wilderness, Moses said, not David, Moses said, he could only be referring to the wilderness because he never made it out of the wilderness. He never went to the promised land. So his generational reference can only be the generation of the wilderness. <laughs> he says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world even from everlasting to everlasting or from eternity past to eternity future. He says you are God. Look at verse 12. So teach us to what? Number, number our days. Who's numbered in the book of Numbers? The tribes of Israel. The members of each tribe. Right? The years that they were in the wilderness. 38 plus years. Once they got away from Sinai then they had 38 plus years in the wilderness in the book of Numbers. Number are what? Days. Why? Because in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 13, 12 spies or surveyors were numbered from the 12 tribes of Israel. And they went into the land of Israel, or Canaan land. And for 40 days, numbering 40 days, they surveyed the land. And after the numbering of 40 days, they came out doubting God, and 40 days was numbered into 40, 40 years. years. It would behoove us to number our days. <laughs> You took 40 days and saw the goodness of the land and you didn't take the next 11 to just say let's cross over? Because it was an 11-day journey to cross over. They could have taken 11 days to just cross into the land originally. But it took 40 days to survey the land and those 40 days became 40 years because for every day, he gave judgment of the year because they didn't believe. We need to number our days. Why? That we may gain a heart of wisdom. And Messianic Psalms like Psalms 102 is found in this book. Of old you laid the foundation of the earth, the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will endure. Yes, they will grow old like a garment, like a cloak. You will change them, and they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will not have no end. That's Psalms 1 again. I mean, Hebrews 1 again, 10 through 12. And the children of the servants will continue, and their descendants will be established before you. Guess when the children of Israel were established? When they crossed over into the promised land. So we see that Psalms uh, 107 give us the conclusion of this matter, and it's book 5. What's book 5? Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy. So we see here that Psalms 107 one says, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is what? Good. Good. His love or his mercy endures forever, his loving kindness. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he has redeemed from the hand of the enemy. Where was Israel redeemed from? hand of the enemy, Egypt. Egypt. 
and gathered out the lands from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south, and they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. Wait a minute, where did they wander? The wilderness. This is the book of Deuteronomy. This is like the last woman testament of Moses. So here is this psalm that speaks of the wandering wilderness coming to a close. Hmm. This is like the book of Deuteronomy. This is the psalm that sets the tone for the rest of this final book of psalms. He says, they wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. When they were wandering in the wilderness, they found no city to dwell in. But when they crossed over into the promised land, God proclaimed Jerusalem as the city where David wanted to build a house. Solomon and his son built a house. So it wasn't until they left the wilderness that they finally found a city. You see, there was a, there was Jericho. God says, no, that, that's not it. There's Bethel. No, that's not it. There's all the cities of Israel. God says, no, there's one place I'll choose to put my name forever. My heart, my eyes, my ears will be there forever to hear the cry of this place. It's Jerusalem. In fact, none of that could happen until they could allow a Yehoshua to take them into the land. Or an Aramaic Yeshua. Guess who has to come back as the Mashiach to bring Israel fully back in the full rights of their land. Yes. Yehoshua. Yehoshua, for an Aramaic, Yeshua. Therefore, Psalms 110 says, a psalm of David, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Recorded in Luke 20, verse 43 by Yeshua, Acts 2.35 and Hebrews 1.13. The Lord shall send the rod of your strength out of Zion, that's Jerusalem, rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power and the beauties of holiness in the womb of the morning. You have the dew of your youth. The Lord has sworn and will not relent. Watch this. Speaking of Messiah, you're a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 5, 6. The Lord is, is at your right hand. He will execute kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the nations. He shall fill the places with dead bodies. He shall execute the dead the heads of the many countries. He shall drink of the brook by the wayside. Therefore, he will lift, he shall lift up the head. Like the senses of Israel. He's going to lift up the heads of Israel because their enemy is going to be defeated. As I close today, I want you to think of all of the songs of David. When David said, oh, how I love thy law. He said that he meditated. It, it was his delight. The Apostle Paul, Rav Shaul, also said, I delight after the law of God, after the inward man. For you and I today, the Torah is the revelation of Yeshua. The prophets are the revelation of Yeshua. But I hope today you will understand even the Psalms of David are the revelation of Yeshua. And if you meditate in the Torah day and night, I encourage you to start meditating in the Psalms of David. The Psalms of David are like a mini Bible. A gospel, if you will, of good news. It reminds me of Isaiah, 66 chapters, like 66 books. And it's a beautiful thing to understand that all of the books of the Torah can be seen fulfilled in theme and in revelation to the Psalms. Yeshua said, those Psalms speak of me. How many believe that Yeshua is in the scroll of the book? Amen. Amen. Will you follow that hand today if you receive this message? Give the Lord a hand of praise. Stand your feet. And let me pronounce the Aharonic benediction over your life. Did you receive today? Yes. Amen. Amen. How many received this blessing today? Number 6, 24 through 26. May the Lord Adonai bless and keep you. May the Lord Adonai shine his face upon you and be gracious to you with divine favor. May the Lord Adonai lift up his countenance upon you and give you perfect peace and Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, Yeshua the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach. Sar Shalom, the Prince of Peace, in his name we pray, Bishem Yeshua. Amen. God bless you today. Shavua Tov. 
May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace Adonai May the Lord bless you and keep you And make His face to shine upon you And be gracious to you May the Lord lift up His countenance upon you May the Lord grant you His peace